and welcome. It's 26th of February 2020. This is GUI and in web browsers and connectivity special interest group weekly call with assortment of people and topics. Um, last week, this call did not happen because we've been uh, on location uh, as a team. Uh, IPFS team week happened and we had some problem solving sessions and overall uh, small hack time. Uh, I want to quickly go over two topics relevant to web browsers that we've talked uh, about during that week. Uh, first was uh, we had a <clears throat> problem solving sessions on defining the future of browser integrations, uh, including companion and beyond. And I believe uh, takeaways from that session. Uh, do we have, are those notes uh, public, Dietrich, do you know? Maybe I'll link them later. Good, uh, good question. Yeah, at the very least, we should go through and probably summarize the decisions that were made. Yeah, so I'll summarize decisions uh, now, uh, like very briefly. And after the call, I'll try to either copy notes from those documents here or just link to them. So if anyone is interested in like who was uh, participating in the session or what uh, topics were discussed, uh, we had pretty good notes from each. Um, the, f the session on the future of browser integrations was more, more or less uh, revisiting uh, the history, uh, how our browser extension uh, evolved over time, who was uh, the, the majority of uh, end users, uh, and what was the purpose. And we've tried to answer the question, is it still the same user base? Is it... Uh, serving the same purpose as before. And more or less we've uh, agreed that it's still uh, a tool aimed at more uh, technical person, because at least that person needs to understand what IPFS is or like IPFS node is and why decentralization matters. Uh, so, it's more user-friendly than before, and we now uh, use it mainly as a vessel for incentivizing people to install IPFS desktop. So when you install when you install IPFS companion, by default it expects you to run uh, Go IPFS locally, and there's a welcome screen which asks you to install Go IPFS or IPFS desktop. Um, and we believe uh, going forward we'll probably remove. Uh, remove uh, features from companion or maybe like not remove features remove them from companion and either add them to desktop or web ui uh, mainly uh, due to the fact uh, how browser extension ecosystem is changing uh, google is working on uh, manifest v3 which will uh, require us to rewrite companion for the third time and uh, then we want to provide a similar user experience no matter if user is using chromium or uh, firefox uh, uh, browser so uh, the idea is to uh, compact the surface of user interfaces exposed by a companion for example the upload screen probably will eventually migrate uh, into web ui uh, right now we got sort of this uh, uh, duality when we have uh, a way of ad importing stuff from companion but also a way of importing it via uh, web ui um, i believe that's uh, more or less uh, the plan um, remove uh, like try when we add a new uh, functionality expose new functionality uh, it should be only something that's possible in the browser extension uh, namely redirect to locally running node uh, or installing like a protocol handler if we have such API at some point and all the user interfaces should probably be delegated to web UI. Um, that was it for this session. Another session was uh, a bit shorter. It was mostly uh, an effort to agree 
when do we switch to CID v1 as a default and what we mean by uh, switching uh, to CID v1. And uh, the decision we've made is that we will probably switch to switch the output. For example, when you add something to IPFS using IPFS add command, and then you get a CID. That CID right now is CID v0, uh, which is uh, multi hash in base 58. We will switch that default output to CID v1 in base 32. And we are planning to do that around Go IPFS 0.6. Uh, what will happen is just changing, just upgrading that final CID from CID v0 to CID v1. We won't be changing internal representation. We won't be changing the CID version of internal nodes in a duck tree. Uh, so if some people may remember that right now you can. Uh, do something like this so if i'm able to yeah you can do like ipfs add you can do ipfs add cid version one and you will get cid uh, v1 in the output the difference is that it's not only changing the version in the output it's also changing the cid version used on every node in the DAG that's created. And that means the final multi-hash in the root will change. Uh, also due to the fact that uh, those intermediate, uh, intermediary nodes use CID v1, it means we now have multi-codec as a part of CID. And thanks to that, the leaves of that tree can be row leaves so the multi codec of those nodes uh, will be row and that also changes uh, all the hashes um, that's why we won't be uh, changing this behavior uh, this flag will produce the same cid uh, we will just update uh, like the help uh, to be very clear on what uh, CID version does. Uh, I believe that uh, was the decision on this session. I'll probably PR and link uh, those changes below. Another session, uh, uh, Jacob, would you want to take this one? Yeah, um, so we talked a bit about running the DHT and JSIPFS. Um, there is a multitude of discussion there around like handling the DHT in Node or what do we do about the DHT running in the browser and like which context of the browser are we running in, you know, an embedded node, are we running on web page? Um, and so what we've kind of decided for now is that with so many updates going on right now in the Go DHT to stabilize, we're going to focus on um, getting that out the door, creating a spec from that, and then revisiting, implementing the DHT, likely around mid-year. Um, and with that, we'll determine like where are things going to be? Because realistically, on a web page, running the DHT isn't terribly realistic, um, just because of the sheer number of connections that we have to do, even in client mode, to query. Um, but there are other contexts in JS that it would make sense to run a DHT. Um, so we want to make sure that we are accounting for all of those. And in the meantime, and in the meantime, uh, in the web browser, we are planning to switch from WebSocket Star to WebSocket Stardust. I, I believe the PR is still open, but uh, it's in the review, right? Yeah. So I was. Uh, I had a back that was in my backlog. I was behind on the review for that, um, but went through that today. Um, so I've got an initial review out for, for Vashko. Um, so we'll likely have some, some updates there. We need to lock down how we want to handle the security of a uh, like client to server. Because when we get the direct connect, the final connection, that's secured through SecIO. Um, but we have had some discussions around Stardust running because we are running when you connect to the server that's currently going to be over websocket star which is already secure so if that also additionally runs over sec.io we get take a performance hit there because we're double encrypting um 
but right now Stardust is actually not restricted to WebSockets because it's a reliable, it's based off of a reliable multi-adder. So it could be TCP, it could be WebRTC underlying, um, and then run the Stardust protocol on top of that. So we can either leave it open and then like take the hit with the double encryption and say, okay, if you want to dial over a Stardust server over TCP or over TC, you, you can totally do that. Um, but then we would need to lock that down more than likely. Otherwise we risk getting like really muddy with configuration options um, or just what it supports. The other option is to just lock it down and say, no, we only support WebSocket star. That way we don't, or WebSocket, secure WebSockets so that we don't have to worry about it and then we can leave it plain text so we don't take that hit on double encryption. Um, so we just need to decide which path forward. More than likely our use case is we're really trying to cover the use case of browser to browser and browser nodes discovering browser nodes. Um, and so that's really the thing that we should be optimizing for. So we'll probably end up just locking it down um, and optimizing for those connections. Mm -hmm. Just just to, to clarify, uh, in, in that browser to browser uh, WebRTC scenario, the, we would not have double encryption. So, so the, this and, is this isn't WebRTC. So this would be WebSocket. So basically, web, the Stardust yeah. is we're running over that uh, that relay as a web WebSocket secure. So that wouldn't be double encryption from the browser to the server. So that would run over WebSocket star. And then when we made the underlying connection, that still gets encrypted. So the underlying stream stays encrypted, but we're just saving on like the connection to the server to negotiate that contract and dial. And then like, as we're streaming peers from that server, that would be only over the WebSocket secure connection. Right, but you were just talking about whether or not we expand Stardust to other connection types. Yes, right? yeah. And that and whether or not those would incur double encryption. So right, and that's really over that connection to to the server. So it doesn't make any difference. Only, okay, okay. Yeah, because like it's going to be double encrypted browser to browser, um, just because we're going to be running SecIO. It's really about that initial connection of just, just to the server having okay. that conversation. Thanks for clarifying. Uh, is it like the first type of uh, transports with this problem or do we have any prior art with like solving double encryption problem? Um, well, like, so WebSocket star was also doing, um, it was a similar scenario. The, the big difference is like we, the reason like we're having this problem with Stardust is that we're basically running a, the refactor is running a libp2p server rather than it being like a socket IO server. It's just, no, this is a libp2p server and it runs WebSocket connections. So really using our own tech to, to be the server. Um, so then we just have to handle the take, accepting the WebSocket connection as the server, um, a secure WebSocket connection. So having the actual like HTTP connection in front um, so this is really why we're getting into that potential of the double encryption um, and having to deal with that. But there's there's no uh, there's no reason why why we have to have double encryption. It's just we haven't done the work for those transports to be aware of the context that they're running in and know that they don't we don't need to the the underlying transport's already encrypted, so we don't need to SecIO encrypt as well. Are we moving away from SecIO also? Yeah, so we will like we'll still have like even when we switch to noise. Like we'll still be, we'll still have that problem of like, we have a connection, we immediately want to run encryption on it um, because we don't have like, oh, I am also already running over that secure yeah. transport. So it's like yeah. getting the we'll context have that way. I, yeah, yeah, yeah. of the multi-adder yeah. breakdown. Um, but I think that's something like eventually we'll probably look at getting smarter about and saying like, okay, this initial connection is WebSocket secure, so I don't need to run the encrypting protocol like I don't need to handle yeah. that for this I, transport. I think like right right now, like it, it, especially given the stage a lot of this stuff is, I think the trade it's a much better trade off to just broaden our set of connectivity options and worry about performance optimization later. Because if that trade if we're double encrypted, we're 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 going to be slower but safer already. But having more routes, I think from a from a higher level is is way more important. 
yeah. we don't solve double encryption ever, computers will just get faster anyway, and so will network connections. So, yeah, yeah, and I think Stardust is it's a stopgap right now anyway. Um, so I think it's like a problem we could probably just punt and say, okay, let's just take the hit on double encryption and uh, punt that problem down the road. Yeah. Also, like uh, I, I become very skeptical when we say something is a stopgap because we've been with some stopgaps around, like some stopgaps uh, are still around and probably will be. And like, even if we have this like the centralized signaling thingy at some point in the future, some people will still want to run Stardust just to make it faster. Uh, and I feel uh, there's another problem of uh, like threat modeling. What could go wrong with the not our encryption if we don't double encrypt, right? Because if we double encrypt, then it's basically like uh, people uh, have this assumption of all like lip P2P transports being based on like pure IDs and basically like encrypted with, with that around those identities, right? And if we uh, sort of like ease those security guarantees in this context, uh, I wonder if that, that would uh, have some ramifications at some point in the future. Uh, like what, what could go wrong with the uh, like WebSocket layer encryption? Like men in the middle based on certs that are there, things like that. Um, I, I would be on the side of double encrypting just to be safe. We can always, uh, especially I think I talked with Vashka and he said like we can always add this like plain text encryption later as an afterthought. Yeah, so basically like what we can do is when we go, when we upgrade connections, like we can give transports upgraders and those upgraders will determine what the upgrade path is. So whether it needs, which encryption it needs, whether it's plain text or SecIO or noise. So we can change that potentially based on context. Um, but yeah, the way I look at it is like, ideally what we would be doing in the future is replacing Stardust with a relay server. And that relay server is going to be running SecIO or noise encryption. Like we probably aren't going to necessarily have uh, no, we will. So like a being able to have a WebSocket secure endpoint on that relay so that WebSocket browsers can hit it. So we're basically doing the same thing. Like we'll have to deal with it there too, but we're running like a full secret relay. And so this is like a stopgap of that because we don't quite have that support. So yeah, I think we just need to take the hit and that will let us broaden out the the transports that we do accept from that Stardust server so that like TCP could actually talk and dial to a browser node um, over Stardust. Just for, from a prioritization feedback, I met with two different groups in the last week who both were saying that this in-browser connectivity is the number one blocker for them in terms of they're, they're, they want to be able to ship IPFS web apps over HTTP and that that's going to be their model for, for years to come. Right, like even once we get native native IPFS, which is still talking about a couple of different, couple of years, just for, uh, you know, best case year, one year for uh, proof of concept, and then a couple of years for a standardization and browser adoption. Probably looking at three, five, seven years possibly, and uh, so this IPFS over HTTP web case, especially browser to browser, is becoming more and more part of what people are going to depend on. One of the pieces of feedback that I heard yesterday from uh, a group that I met with that have their own proof of stake blockchains, the developer the ecosystem they're building up and an incubator accelerator. So they have a bunch of companies that are building on top of the stack is that um, IPFS is one of the few projects in the space that actually kind of speaks directly to in browser as a use case. So some of the other projects don't really treat browser as a first class customer and they really thought that we did. But the problem was that it just does from there for uh, I think the way they described it was we treat it seriously, but it just doesn't work yet. So they were like, we love that you treat it seriously and that the brain you think of browser running in browser should be first class citizen and we just need it the basics to work. And once the basic connectivity works, we can build so much more stuff on top of it. So this is from a you know the, the un un unblocking the people that want to build on our stack and really making our stack work first class for how people build and develop apps today these connectivity blockers are, are just going to become increasingly important for us to, to resolve. Yeah. 
Cool. More fuel for the fire. Uh, maybe I can go briefly over the, the grant. Um, I made a draft of a uh, grant for uh, <clears throat> coming up with native protocol handler for browser extensions. Um, and uh, it will probably uh, land in the grant sweep or soon, but basically uh, the idea is to uh, create a new API uh, that enables browser extension to register a handler that is capable of returning arbitrary bytes to, to the browser, to the rendering process. Uh, and that unlocks a lot of interesting things. So the value is for decentralization with no longer need, like IPFS, but also protocols like that and secure scuttlebutt could uh, use this uh, new API for uh, returning uh, data fetched from distributed network without relying on some sort of like third party service. Uh, local and offline uh, use cases could be uh, built on top of that. Uh, a lot of extensions rely on uh, some servers which act as a half of the function, like are responsible for a half of functionality. And for IPFS, we of course would be, not be uh, forced to run local HTTP gateway for users who want to very light uh, experience just to upload file or get a file. Uh, we would be able to run embedded JS IPFS in the regular uh, browser, because that's the only missing piece right now if you want to run ipfs in firefox or chrome in the browser extension you can run js ipfs in it the problem is when you fetch bytes you are you are not able to provide them to to the renderer process to display an html page um, so uh, we've been talking with uh, open source consult consultancy uh, uh, called uh, Igalia. Uh, I believe Dietrich uh, mentioned them before. Uh, right now, I wrote uh, a lot of like prior arts. So we have those web APIs in where regular website can re re register this like fake handler, which is just a redirect to some web service somewhere. So those are like web based. Uh, protocol handlers, which require web plus prefixes for most of protocols. Another prior art we have is in Firefox. Browser extensions are able to put uh, protocol handlers in manifest of their extension. Uh, and that automates this re redirect based registration. It's still a fake protocol because it redirects to some other URL. So you need to have a server somewhere who will handle uh, the URI. Uh, and finally, we had uh, native handlers before. We had one in muon Base Brave uh, before they switched to Chromium. And we had this uh, famous, <laughs> famous uh, proof of concept uh, when we had Firefox Natalie with Lip D Web uh, experiments, uh, which was basically what uh, we want uh, from this grant. Uh, uh, but uh, the thing that we want in this grant is that sort of like functionality, but for Chromium based vendors. That's mostly because uh, the browser vendors who are most vocal about, uh, most interested about uh, enabling IPFS support uh, are Chromium based. Um, so that's uh, the, the, the plan for this uh, grant is to unlock that type of integrations. Uh, I should be uh, posting this uh, at some point this week, maybe next week. Uh, but basically we want to create an API specification, uh, which could be adopted by other browser vendors. So it should be like generic, not specific to IPFS. It should be general purpose protocol handler for browser extensions. And then uh, we want, uh, as part of this grant, we want a, a in an implementation of this API as a set of patches on top of Chromium code base, which uh, brow brow like browser vendors such as Brave uh, could uh, apply. Um, and there, are, there will be like additional resources. So this grant will be not only like 
interested from the grant perspective, like grant creating perspective, but also if anyone is interested in history or what's actually possible on the web platform, it will have like a lot of resources and like list of chronological, chronological uh, prior art. So I feel it will be interesting resource. I will link it later when it's uh, published on the uh, DevGrant repo. Um, yeah, that's a, that's a fantastic spelunking into the history of uh, how, how many people have tried to do something like this. Um, it's, and and what, what, one of the things that we're doing here is kind of an end run around browser vendors that are, you know, the big browser vendors are not really interested in adopting this type of, of really powerful functionality. Uh, you know, even in even in Mozilla, the the pushback from an engineering and and engineering groups, also the security groups around some of these, uh, were 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 pretty strong, um, and 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 not without good reason, right? Like really uh, really well founded concerns, and that's something there where we're using this to really push on the boundaries of that. And we have partners in browsers, smaller browsers, but still big enough that are willing to do that experimentation and take those risks. So, like kind of we're short circuiting that a bit. Where if we can get something landed in Chromium, and this will be our first our first experiment in getting kind of code landed in Chromium as well, related to this type of functionality, and this is going to be something where it, it might even be a hard no from that perspective. Um, it'd be very interesting to see how open source Chromium project is when it comes to evaluating something that is off by default and only enabled for say Brave uh, or one or two other browsers, but not used by Chrome. Um, you create this environmental pressure. On, on these organizations around how they make decisions, how they evaluate functionality, and how they make those trade-offs around um, uh, a developer adoption and, and a, number, a number of other things. So it's a pretty nuanced play in, in, in figuring out where our levers are for having influence in these organizations um, and be able to have somebody like Agalia who's really interested in, in, in both that model but also have the keys when it comes to being embedded in those communities and landing code. Is is really really powerful. So it's it's been great to talk with them. Uh, Lila, I think getting getting their feedback on this earlier rather than later would be really good idea. So I wouldn't worry about putting it into the repo first to be able to share with them. They share with them and get their feedback because it's going to be an iterative process to be able to figure out what the right format is that both meets our our IPFS Dev Grants kind of format requirements and also something that has the level of detail and structure that they need to be able to do the work. So I'd, I'd say for, first off, get this in, in front of them and get feedback there. This is fantastic. Thanks for writing this up. While we have you here, I believe Unstoppable Demo Browser was started by you? Yes, so I think I added a bunch of these. Yeah. <laughs> I met with uh, Unstoppable at ETH Denver and, and had an interesting conversation. We've talked with them before. Um, and but the the new wrinkle was you know I, I did a talk kind of about our ecosystem group and also the browser work that we're doing at the decentralized network summit uh, the day before ETH Denver, and they were there and they they were basically like this, you just talked about you you just did our talk for us these are the kind of things that we want to see happen with with IPFS and 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 distributed web and browsers so they're very interested in in doing this kind of work they shipped that demo browser which has the unstoppable domain stuff built in, but also has a built-in IPFS node. Uh, it also has built-in, several built-in gateway options. So it's, it's worth actually just going, like you, you, you load the browser, and the first thing you see is this banner across the bottom that's like, you don't have an IPFS node running. You should run one to be able to support the distributed web. But then if you actually go turn on your IPFS desktop, and you're like, make sure, you're like, I got desktop running, what the hell, like I have a node. They don't detect a local node. They actually run a node in the browser. Fa just so fascinating. So it's very, and I haven't really dug into the, the source code at all. Like, did they just bundle JSIP or JMS IPFS and run that node? Are they running a Go node? I don't know. Um, uh, so it would be worth spelunking a little bit. Uh, I filed an issue in their repo around implementing our addressing spec, and they, were, they replied immediately to me on email saying, hey, yeah, we'll totally look at that. Um, but they really, they really, they said that they want for this browser to be a place for people to experiment. So this is something where we can maybe you know, work and, and, and talk about um, and really demo and hack on some of what Chromium, underlying Chromium changes would be like. Uh, the, the weird bit is like, you know, this is, I think, Electron based. It's not like they forked Brave or something like that. So you don't get the full browser, but you know, a lot of the basic functionality is there. Um, so really, I think socializing and highlighting these type of experiments uh, really helps us push the, you know, socialize what the boundaries of what a browser or a web browser could do, what 
what could look like, how it might work. Um, if they implement the addressing spec, we uh, we then now now have a desktop browser that you can download that has a IPFS protocol handler, which would be pretty amazing, and also might help prove out some of those protocol handler paths. Right, multiple limitations is always going to be nice. So even if we say have the native Kermi one, that's and you know maybe be a longer term project with Galia, but then we have something like this where we have an experimental vehicle that we could play with and fork. Like we could even fork this and just IPFS put an IPFS logo on it and play with it and push stuff out there, and have their services built in. Uh, we could we could I, I'm really interested in having lots of these uh, lots of these experiments in name resolution be easily accessible to developers. Um, right now, these, these feel like both uh, ENS and Unstoppable are different ways of solving this naming problem. And I think we're going to see a lot of competition and experimentation in that place over time. Uh, there's not one winner. There might be a pattern that emerges and standard, standard around this. Uh, and talking with them at Denver, they're also interested in kind of standards track participation as well. So worth, worth checking out. Uh, I told them, uh, I pointed them at the at the list for IPFS Weekly, and then said we'd love to have them uh, demo and and introduce the the browser to the community, talk about how it's implemented in the future. So hopefully they'll they'll do that, and we'll be able to have uh, a demonstration from from them in front of our community. Yeah, totally. Especially like uh, having them uh, as an super early adopters of our addressing spec uh, and very smooth transition to the next one, the browser design guidelines. That's like the perfect no. test ground. I know that. this is, it is the perfect test ground for that. Um, and this is something that between, between moving and then ETH Denver and then Team Week, I'm probably about a month behind on where I want to be with that. I need to do a final pass. Uh, Jim is starting to move on to the mobile, mobile IPFS design research. Uh, the, that grant just got approved, but that's, that's more like mobile uh, as a big circle with browsers as a sub mobile browsers as a subset of that work. So broadening the scope there, um, but also some, some stuff related to browsers. But for the, the first one, the, the design guidelines, I still need to do the final pass on the content, fix up the iconography section, because I think we made some changes there. Uh, thanks to your feedback and comments, Lytle. And uh, so I need to integrate those changes and then I need to basically communicate it and share it, um, write up a post about it. Yeah. I believe uh, I did uh, like a pass before Team Week, okay. uh, just around uh, uh, visuals. Uh, I, I was just very uh, skittish about like, sort of like having fake addresses, which are not actually following our addressing spec oh, okay. on the yeah. screenshots. So I added like comment for, for every occurrence I found, so that may be helpful. Another thing I identified is a sor sort of like uh, maybe not a sort like a blind spot around uh, iconography. Uh, it's distinction between mutability and immutability. That's maybe even like a wider, like a separate yeah. uh, research. How people understand that, or how to communicate that to yeah. people, because a lot of people don't even know that this distinction exists. And like in IPFS, we got. Uh, like re replacing the green padlock means not only uh, indicating like integrity guarantees, not only like the transport uh, encryption guarantees, but I believe also we sh sort of should have uh, a way of telling this is immutable uh, address or this is an address that may like the content may change. Yeah, like um, a, like um, like. There's this, it's, it's basically a new trust model. It's not even like a wrinkle or a change to the existing trust model. Uh, it's a type of guarantee of content validity that is not rooted in external trust systems, but is more like internal integrity. And uh, the trust model is out of band. And, and that's something that we really wrestled with and went back and forth on. And ultimately, I think like for this, for the purposes of this first version, narrowing the field of view to be able to focus on like what's the minimum set of things that browsers should this should design for in a way that also respects protecting the user in, like as, as, as much as possible. Um, it, it's really a hard, it's hard to draw boundaries there without really boiling the ocean. So I think yeah. it's narr narrowing the field of view for the, for each one of these and making them as bite-sized as possible is going to be. Yeah, totally. Can. Especially even the, given the fact like f for this like demo browser, uh, we can see like, 
for us as IPFS project, we know that IPFS namespace is immutable and IPNS namespace is mutable. And for us, it's ju just like, like water for fish. We don't even know it's there. However, when people start implementing that, they put like mutable names in immutable protocol name. Uh, and also like regular people don't really know what either of those things is. So probably instead of like relying on protocol scheme or names, we need sort of like iconography or like better. I, I love that example too, like what you're sharing right now, where you have the mutable name, but then the tab title is actually the immutable address. Yeah, it, it's like the, the protocol is for uh, immutable namespace. The CID is like immutable snapshot. But that snapshot is published under this mutable name. Uh, yeah, it's pretty interesting. I don't want to like uh, derail uh, the call too much, but I, I agree. It's super... the, these are the questions that we really have to answer. Like, yeah. in order to be able to achieve mass adoption, we need to be able to figure. Like, we need to get that part of our house in order and communicated really well and really well understood in a way, and have the resources for people who are thinking about adopting to be able to have them make these evaluations, especially if they're they're designing for for millions and millions of users. It's super important. It's not going to be easy. It's going to take a long time. Uh, we don't have to get it right the first time, but um, you know, make, trying to re reduce the set of decisions that people have to make, even if it means we make some trade-offs, is it, going to be the most important bit this year, I think. Uh, still within the browser topic, uh, browser vendor realm, uh, an update on Oprah. Yeah, so they, we have the latest build from them. I think that we're still mostly on on track for releasing pretty soon, but the, we're you know playing this dance with with the release of a point five of Go IPFS and getting the CID and subdomain support and subdomain gateway support really well settled. Uh, having that those changes propagate amongst to all the the big gateway partners too is is really important. So um, we're play, play play playing this race condition kind of game to be able to figure out when the right time is and how, what the minimal set of changes are. Uh, but it, 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 we're still it generally on track for, for the next few months. I think this next item is me as well. We are thinking about uh, a browser and connectivity meetup at some point. Um, uh, I think the, the, a bigger group uh, probably meeting at the IETF 108 meetup in mid-July in Madrid so uh, ITF 107 is in Vancouver next, at the end of next month in March. And just looking at the, the tracks there, I think it would be fantastic to have all of the browser folks, uh, the, the libp2p folks especially, um, even if not participating in these discussions, coming and be part of the hallway conversation and, and lurking and getting to know the people that are making these decisions. There are whole tracks around distributed networking. And a, a lot of these like, technologies that we're kind of hacking around or building on top of because the underlying transport doesn't meet our needs, decisions about how those underlying transports are being made in these meetings. So having us be part of that conversation is really crucial to PL having and having that influence in that industry where our use cases are really well heard and being part of that, the arc of how that technology changes over longer periods of time. Um, so I think there's a lot of support for this and I think we're going to see, I'm seeing more and more of this bubble up in PL generally around the, you know, being in the drama of, of being part of these conversations. Uh, it, it's one thing to try to sh short circuit them and we still, still try to do that as well. We're going to do that in a couple of big ways this year, I think. Uh, but you, really, these are parallel tracks from, from an influence and, and, and change, making change that we want to see in the world standpoint. So being, being part of that conversation while we're also short circuiting or hacking around really helps them understand our vision. So, and, and, and our, our needs and where, where the current transport level of transports aren't meeting our needs. So I would encourage you to go look at the uh, IAT, IATF 107 schedule. So if you look at the day by day schedule for Vancouver and you see like the set of working groups that are meeting and you're like, ah, oh. I was like, yep, I want to be in that one and that one and that one. And I actually canceled, I was planning to go to 107 and I decided to cancel because it's just, it really re would require, I think, taking the whole week off to be able to be present in those conversations and to be able to really learn and really soak it in. So it's something that I'm really, I'm gonna recommend for this particular group, if we're doing, if you're doing work on JS Lib P2P, uh, if you're doing well, Lib P2P generally should probably be there, um, but our, specifically our work around our browsers and, and, and uh, network in networking and connectivity in the web content context. Uh, this is something where I'd almost say like, let's just take, take the entire week, uh, not take it off, but take off our IPFS hat, 
out and just really sit in on these conversations in Madrid in July and sit in, and soak it all in and learn who the people are, how they communicate with each other, how the ITF works. At the beginning of every ITF work, they actually have like a newbies uh, meetup the day before the conference starts where they have like an introduction to how the ITF works. So things like that are, are really nice from an onboarding perspective, but I'd love to see as many people as we can from, the, from this group be part of that. And then what we'll probably do is maybe, you know, tack on three days uh, at the beginning or end of that to be able to do browser specific hacking and work. Um, but that, that's, that's tentative for now, but kind of block that out on your calendar for mid, I think it's mid to late July in Madrid. It will late, be late July nice 25th through the 31st. Nice and hot. Yes. Hot hamon for everyone. Uh, the next one I think is also me. Hugo demoed all this amazing in-browser and extension level testing framework last week. How does that affect us? Lytle, do you have any idea? We have this testing matrix of all these things that we want to test. Eventually, we haven't got there yet. Are any of these testing scenarios for desktop or extension or web unlocked for us from the work that Hugo did? Is there any transition that we need to be able to make there? Yeah, so uh, most of our modules are, like most of JS stack is using Azure uh, and Azure was using Karma, which Hugo aims to replace. And I talked with Hugo and he effectively like want, want, wants to, the moment he's able to do the same things in this new runner, he wants to switch to that because it's like not only much smaller, like it, there's like, the, the, the difference is not that visible, but if you like look how complex the old solution was and how small and relatively elegant the new one is, uh, it's like no brainer for us to switch. So I think a lot of uh, switching will happen behind the scenes, uh, just Azure switching to this new runner uh, without uh, the need for doing anything. For uh, IPFS Companion specifically, I'm excited because it's for the first time uh, enables us to run tests against actual web extension runtime instead of uh, like seen on mocks and stubs. Uh, the problem is uh, right now those uh, uh, those APIs, uh, run, like the runner works only in Chromium. And I, I want to, uh, the mo like I have a PR to, uh, to run tests. Those will be like effectively a separate set of tests, uh, but those would be like a smoke test similar to what we have for web UI, like for end-to-end -end testing. Uh, very small surface, but uh, they guarantee that nothing breaks along the long, long pipeline of things that happen. Uh, but that will not land until Firefox support uh, is present, uh, mainly because the key value of that test suite is to detect differences between Firefox and Chromium, the differences in behavior, like web extension APIs, like they don't even agree on the name how <laughs> APIs are named. Um, and that same API may take same arguments, but behave differently. And we had that over and over. Uh, and that would be the value for companion. Um, for web UI, we probably would switch to, uh, we would not use the runner, but we may switch from Puppeteer uh, to that new underlying library. Uh, just because it's more reliable. Like so far we've had no problems with Puppeteer, so it's like low priority. Uh, that's probably uh, it. Uh, most, like long story short, Azure will eventually switch and not much to do on our end, mostly on companion end. That, that's great. And uh, running companion, actually being able to test companion in a real browser environment is, is really, really nice. I'm also interested in his work to get this for this infrastructure running with test ground, so then we can say, you know, spin up, spin up a whole lot of a lot of browser nodes. Yeah, and also uh, when uh, Google Chrome releases this new uh, version of APIs, manifest v3, uh, we, like all the tests for that uh, from the get go will start. We will use uh, Hugo's uh, framework just to run in that specific uh, actual uh, runtime. Um, Cool, uh, I, I've added it to the highlights. So I've added two things to the highlights section. 
Uh, one is that uh, I've released a new version of IPFS Companion to the beta channel. And it's a version that is addressing our problems with Chrome Web Store. So there's a, uh, an issue with never, I made one issue because I would be creating issues over and over again. And now I just have this one and I reuse it for all the problems we have with Chrome Web Store. So it's a bit long. Uh, basically uh, what happened uh, is that Chrome Web Store now asks for permission justification for every permission that your extension asks for. Uh, it's pretty good idea in theory, but in practice, it's super automated and when you get rejected you don't get like human readable feedback it's just like a robot saying hey you did not comply to our privacy policy please fix it but they don't say what uh, luckily we had uh, some uh, help from simon uh, from Google and we were able to fix those issues. I made a new beta release which removed unused permissions and uh, hopefully will pass the review. Um, it takes time, about a week uh, to get approved. Uh, so the moment the beta is released, we will be able to reuse the same descriptions for stable channel. Uh, why it's important because uh, the Chrome Web Store so far uh, is used as a distribution platform for all the Chromium-based browsers, including Microsoft Edge, Brave. Um, and if you take a look I at- That's crazy. Yeah, and if you take a look at uh, our user base, so it's like 26K of users on Chrome Web Store compared to like 2K on Firefox Store. So yes, it matters. <laughs> um, well, I don't think it will get better. Uh, Google is investing into uh, Manifest V3. Uh, I probably uh, mentioned that on uh, previous calls, but in case someone wants to read more about what Manifest V3 is, we got this prop properly numbered issue in IPFS Companion repo. Uh, and I try to like follow up uh, developments uh, Re related bugs and things like that. Um, we'll see what happens when Google decided, like when Chrome Web Store decides we only accept uh, manifest with free extensions. That will probably mean uh, Brave, Opera, Edge, and all of the other uh, Chromium based browsers that still support the old API uh, will either provide own stores uh, or will a community-based store will be created. It remains to be seen. And another update uh, and shout out to Enrique for fixing our chocolatey package, which I had no idea what went wrong, but he fixed it. So I have no idea either. That's <laughs> it just worked. It's green. All checks are passing. Um, if, uh, yeah, so background is like chocolate is like a package manager for uh, Windows, right? Um, and we got a package for IPFS desktop there. So if you are using uh, that, you can install latest version of desktop with this command, and then you will get updates over time. Um, I believe that's it from my end. Uh, where are we at with the uh, IPFS desktop signing on Mac? Mac OS. Yeah, that's a good question. <laughs> um, I believe we- Can we install IPFS on Mac yet? Yes, unless you are using Catalina, then uh, you have a nasty pop-up. Um, I believe we, have, we just need to uh, invest time into that notarization step. Because we are already signing, I, I, I like I try to understand uh, prior art in our continuous integration setup, and we are already like we already have uh, keys. We are already signing, and signing happens on our CI. So every time we make a release, it gets signed. Uh, then uh, there's this additional step. Uh, sadly, I don't have Mac, so <laughs> it's just me reading about stuff. Uh, but uh, probably will. Uh, 
should be possible to try to leverage our CI infrastructure, even if we don't have our uh, own hands. Yeah, in the short term, I have a Mac developer environment and certificate and all that account and all that kind of stuff. So I can, if you can send me uh, whatever steps you know are the next ones, and then I can do the notarization step. Yeah, I, I'm not sure if we can mix. So if it's signed uh, by one key, you cannot notarize right. using the other. But I think we got uh, credentials in like shared uh, votes. So ah uh, okay, nice. Yeah. Uh, probably uh, after the call. Okay, we'll cool. See that. Yep. Right on. So much, so much cool stuff happening. We have the too much cool stuff problem. Right now. Yeah, too much. Good, good problem. Could be like less cooler. Yeah, totally. I think that cat, that that Catalina it, that Catalina cool. one's burning, gonna burn us. So we need to be, that one. Send yeah. send what send whatever info you have after after the call, and then I'll yeah. just follow the rest of the signing steps because I've done that for I've done it for mobile stuff. I've never done it for a desktop one, but I'm familiar with just how crappy and terrible that workflow and those UIs are. All right. Cool. Nice to see you all. Take care. Bye-bye. See you next week.